Welcome to Hill Country Homilies, weekly homilies from Holy Annunciation Orthodox Church in Liberty Hill, Texas. Holy Annunciation is an old calendar Orthodox Church, sharing the faith of the apostles and the love of Christ with all who seek His truth. Now let's listen to this week's homily. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Amen. We are on. Now on the second Sunday of the Triodian, which is the Sunday of the prodigal son, uh, unfortunately not able to be with all of you on uh, the previous Sunday, but we had a very nice liturgy at our mission in Georgia. Um, they are officially underway now. Uh, they held their first reader service today. So uh, after several liturgies, they're finally sort of launching on their own into, uh, into the requirement of having weekly services which is what it takes to uh to to get a mission underway so please keep uh the reader simon and all of the uh faithful of the georgia mission in your prayers as they uh begin to work towards being a regular worshiping community um <clears throat> this sunday uh in our preparation for great lent the church appoints for us, the hearing of the gospel parable of the prodigal son. And this is a familiar parable. We hear it uh, every year at this time. We see it referenced numerous times throughout the year as we talk about uh, things that compare uh, to this parable. We see it written extensively uh, on the church fathers because it, it is such a, a wonderful story of fall and repentance and return and forgiveness and reception back into the good graces of, of our God, uh, that it's really, you know, one of, of, of the best stories to prepare us for Lent. Last Sunday, of course, we heard the publican and the Pharisee, which is another one. It's, it's very much based on humility in combination with repentance. Um, and as I said last night, you know, so often humility ties to repentance because the man who has lowered himself in, in humility has only upward to gaze, whereas the man who in his pride raises him above others can look down much more easily than he can cast his gaze up to heaven. Uh, we see that humility bringing about repentance also here in the gospel story of the prodigal son. I want to talk about three uh, elements from our gospel reading today. The first thing that I want to talk about is the actual fall of the prodigal because we are told that after demanding his inheritance, after a few days, he sets out away from his father. And so there's this sense of distance. We're telling he's gone into this foreign land. And, you know, that, of course, is, is um, in, in the story given as an absolute, a measurement to denote the distance between the son and the father. But the, the fall of the prodigal, the departure of the prodigal, is not a mere matter of distance because one can remain faithful to the needs and the habits and the manner of their family even if they journey some distance abroad. The fall of the prodigal in this case is as much about their change, their complete change in conduct and behavior that accompanied this physical distance. And just as we can remain faithful to the teachings and habits and manners of our family a long distance off, we can depart greatly when we're in close proximity if we change or alter our conduct, our behavior, our beliefs. Those things are as much a departure as traveling physical distance. St. Ambrose said, what is more afar off than to depart from one's own self, to be separate not by country, but by habits? For he who severs himself from Christ is an exile from his country 
and a citizen of this world. Fitly, then, he wastes his patrimony who departs from the church. This departure, this distance, is not merely one of space. It's also one of conduct. We're told that in this distant land of utter want and famine, the prodigal son joins himself to a citizen and that he basically becomes a servant and his job is to feed the pigs. And this poor position that he would have loved to receive the same food, these old corn husks that the pigs received, but not even that was, was being given to him. This is quite a fall from the son of the rich man uh, with, with the nice uh, estate and business. And it's an interesting choice in the parable that he's feeding the pigs because swine do not have the greatest reputation in scripture. From the earliest time, of course, they're considered unclean and not fit for consumption. Yet here's this man who was beloved of his father and cared for in every way, but in his separation, he's been lowered to caring for the most reviled of the beasts. The pigs in this particular parable, they represent all of the sinful things of the world, which the prodigal has now embraced by his departure. St. Bede says that to be sent to the farm is to be enthralled by the desire of worldly substance. And Blessed Theophilus says, he feeds those that surpassed others in vice, such are panderers, arch robbers, arch publicans, who teach others their abominable works. And note this, in his reckless embrace of the passions and temptations of the world, though the son feeds them with abandon, his own condition grows more acute because the feeding of the passions will never fill your own belly with the things you need for sustenance, not even if that passion is gluttony. Rather, he's feeding the beast unto his own death, which would surely have followed were it not for his repentance. The next element of the story is when the prodigal son, we're told, he comes to himself. And that's a, a, a wonderful sort of phrase that I think denotes what repentance really is. Here he is, he's departed from himself, departed from his father and himself and his ways. And in turning around, we're told that he comes to himself. Now, we've spoken many times of the repentance of the prodigal and the father's forgiveness, and so I won't attend to it long today. But we should bear in mind that it is this complete repentance that must accompany our return. It's a change in mind and a change in action alike. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, the younger son had despised his father when he first departed and had wasted his father's money. But when in course of time, he was broken down by hardship, having become a hired servant and eating the same food with the swine, he returned chastened to his father's house. And we should note that the son was aware of his bad situation when he added, and I perish, and I perish. This is true repentance in mind, and it becomes repentance in action when he starts the journey back to his father. So understand there are two things going on here. First is the son's realization how far he has fallen, and that he is perishing as a result of that departure from the habits and manners and teachings of his father. But had he merely had that realization and remained where he was, he would have perished. He had to start on the way back to the Father. So it's not just the mental understanding, but the action of the return that completes his repentance. The repentance in mind becomes repentance in action when he starts on the road back to his Father. And what is his repentance marked by? A confession, right? He makes this confession. In fact, he practices the confession he's going to make. I'll... I'll go to my father and I'll say, I've sinned before thee and before heaven. Take me as a hired servant. And so repentance coupled with action 
coupled with confession, creates this change in his mind that leads the father to receive him. St. Augustine says, before he perceived God afar off, when he was yet piously seeking him, his father saw him. It was not that he had seen the father and come to him, but he was on his way. So the father saw him because he was seeking. St. Gregory of Nyssa says that his meditating confession won the father back to him such that he went out and rushed to meet him. The example of the prodigal calls each of us whenever for a shorter extended time we may stray from God and indulge ourselves in the pleasure of the world calls us back to this repentance. And St. John Chrysostom urges us to emulate the return of the prodigal when he writes, let us do likewise and not be worried with the length of the way for if we are willing, the return will become swift and easy provided that we desert sin which led us out from our father's house. For the Father pities those who return. And that's precisely what happened in the parable. Seeing his son far off, struggling his way back, the Father runs and embraces him, falls on his face. The Father falls down before the Son and puts a ring on his finger, kills the fatted calf, and they celebrate. And all rejoice except one. All rejoice except one. And that's the older brother in the story. And we should not lose the importance of the older brother's refusal to enter into the feast. The older brother was in the field and as he's drawing near to the house, he hears the music and the dancing. He calls the servants. He says, what's going on? And they said, your brother's come. And because your father's received him safe and sound, he's killed the fatted calf. And we're told that the brother was angry and would not go in. St. Cyril of Alexandria tells us that the older son signifies Israel according to the flesh and the others who left the father, the multitude of the Gentiles. The envy of the older brother is the envy that the Jews had to Christ and to the opening of the church to the Gentiles. You see, envy separates us from God. Here we have the older brother who felt that he had been faithful to the father. And he was so jealous that his younger brother, who had been off with the harlots, off wine, women, and song in the distant land, decides to come crawling back, and the father wraps him in his arms and celebrates, and celebrates. And St. Ambrose says in speaking, of the older brother, if he ceases to envy, he will feel all things to be his, either as a Jew possessing the sacraments of the Old Testament or as a baptized person, those of the new. This is very, very important because when the, older, when the younger brother is received back, what does the older brother lose? Nothing. Nothing. Everything that the older brother had, everything the older brother still has everything the older brother will have in the future, is not in any wise diminished by the return of the younger brother. But he envies the attention, the celebration of that return, when here he has been faithful in his mind through the years. We should remember the cautionary tale of the older brother whenever we hear the gospel of St. Matthew promise that he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The older brother had been faithful, 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 but now he was angry and he refused to go in. Despite his years of unquestioning service to the father, he's so overwrought with envy that right at the end, his endurance is testing. And what he fails to realize is that faithfulness is its own reward. And the father tells him, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. But it's right that we should make Mary and be glad for your brother who was dead, is alive again, who was lost, is now found. The return of the younger brother suffered nothing to the older <coughs> brother, but yet envy threatened his very salvation when he turns his back and refuses to come in. Brothers and sisters, as we depart today, 
Let us give thanks to our loving Father who receives us back with a loving embrace whenever we may stray, whether for a week, an hour, years. Let us give thanks for his steadfast love, knowing that when we endure to abide in him, all that he has is ours and our inheritance is never in the least diminished by the return of the lost or the entry of the new. So let us in this time of preparation rejoice with the Father for all who come into the church, whether newly baptized or returning faithful, for it is right that we should make merry and be glad in the joyous reception of the lost to a life in Christ. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, glory to Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening to Hill Country Homilies. For more information, visit Holy Annunciation Orthodox Church at www.annunciationtx.com. And please join us again next week.